This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Imagine you had 100 people and you need to decide who your ideal partner is. The rules are quite simple. You can speak to any number of people that you want to, although you can only speak to each person once. This essentially means that after speaking to somebody, you could decide to reject this person and to speak to somebody else. Although something important to note is that you can't go back and speak to somebody that you've already rejected. Alternatively, you could accept this person as your ideal partner, at which point you would not get to speak to anybody else, and therefore the game would end here. The other important thing to note is that you don't know anything about the person before you speak to them, which means you can't see a particular person and decide to speak to them first, or specifically decide to avoid some people as well. The order in which you speak to people is completely random. Simple enough. The question of this video is now obvious. What is the best way to ensure that you choose your ideal partner? The first thing to do is to completely understand the question we're asking. We can redraw our grid, but rather than drawing the people, let's write our compatibility with each person, which would range from 1 to 100. We would again randomly choose people, although remember that we wouldn't know how compatible we are with each person until after the experiment had finished. After speaking to a couple people, you might speak to the absolute best person the person you are 100% compatible with. And it seems quite obvious that we would choose this person. Although at this point, we wouldn't know that this is the best person. And unfortunately, it's actually quite likely that you'd reject this person, hoping for somebody better. After speaking to a couple more people, you would eventually find someone who's extremely good, although still worse than somebody you've already spoken to. At which point you would settle for somebody who is definitely very good, but not the best. With that in mind, let's do what I do in all my videos. Let's simplify the problem and see if we can find a method. Let's consider if we had just three people. In this case, how do we find the best person? Something important to remember is that before we speak to each person, they're a mystery to us. So then how do we do this? A very good method to solve this is something which you could probably guess yourself. So please give it a try before I explain it. Let's start by speaking to the first person, and after some awkward small talk, you can roughly say how well you thought it went, and independently of how well or badly it went, you need to reject the first person, which may seem a little strange, although this first date can be quite useful, as it almost sets a standard for us. Now, when we speak to the next person, if this person is better than the first person, then you accept the second person, and this is your ideal match, statistically. Now let's say your second date goes horribly. She did biology or doesn't watch videos about maths on YouTube, so you think the second date was worse than the first one. Then you would reject this person and hope that the final person is better than both the dates you've already been on. Regardless of how good they are, at this point you would need to accept the final person as there's no other people left, making the last person your ideal partner. And there we go, quite an effective way to try and decide the best person. Something I've mentioned a couple times in this video is that we know nothing about these people before we speak to them, which means we could have spoken to these people in any possible order. Using our method where we set the first person as a comparison, and then accept the first person who's better than them, will result in scenarios where we could accept each person as our ideal partner, given the right conditions which seems counterintuitive. This might be a little bit harder to understand, so like before, let's represent our people with numbers we can order the people in terms of how compatible we were with them. We can say that one means we're the least compatible with them and three means we're the most compatible with them. Using this system, we can begin to list the possible orders in which we could have spoken to the people. For example, person one, then person two, and then person three. There was an equally likely chance that we could have spoken to them in the order of one, then three, then two, or it could have been two, one, three or it could have been any of these possible orders. Also, don't forget that each of these possible orders was equally likely. Let's now consider the top row. Using our method, we always reject the first person, as they are the comparison. Since we're using numbers now, when we say that we accept the first person who's more compatible than the comparison, all we're really asking is if the new number is bigger than the first. In the first case, we can see that we are more compatible with 2 than 1, so we accept 2. Due to this particular method, 
it does mean that we didn't choose the best person. But all this method tries to do is maximise the chance that we do choose the ideal partner. Let's now consider the second row. We again use the first person as our comparison, although in this case we actually do choose the best person. We can move on to the third row, which is now slightly different. The number that we used for our comparison is 2. Since 2 is bigger than 1, we will actually reject 1, meaning that we choose the ideal partner, 3. In the fourth row, the comparison remains the same, although in this order, we don't even speak to person 1. To save time, I'll just show what happens with the remaining ones, completing them the same way. Remembering that each of these orders is equally likely, and using the diagram, we can see that 50% of the time, we choose the absolute best person, which is extremely high. We can see that one third of the time, we will choose the second best match, which is still quite good. Although unfortunately, around 17% of the time, we do choose the biology student. Considering that we knew nothing about these people beforehand, these results are extremely impressive, and I hope you agree. Using this, we can go back to the original problem. Let's reconsider all 100 people. Again, we want to reject the first couple of people that we speak to, to act as our comparison. When we had only three people, the comparison consisted of just one person, since the sample was quite small. If the comparison remained at only one person, then it's very likely that a lot of people are better than the comparison, and would therefore be chosen instead of the ideal partner. It would make sense then that we vary the size of the comparison to compensate for the larger group of people, but then how many people should be in the comparison? Would it be 33, since it's one third of 100? Or would it be 50 or 20? It's difficult to extrapolate from just one result. This brings up a new problem to answer the original question, which is how many people do we reject before we start accepting? Or in other words, how many people are used in our comparison? From here, the math becomes a lot more complicated using some basic calculus and approximations, although it's definitely still doable. We just developed the techniques we already used throughout the video, although we'll add some numbers to it. But at this point, I will say, feel free to skip to the solution. And at the end, I've got some special, insightful, and I wish not first-hand advice. Even though the math is less easy, do you know what is easy and free? The sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive learning platform that offers you a vast array of courses in science, mathematics, engineering, and more. Brilliant offers bite-sized interactive courses that make grasping tough topics like these a breeze. Whether you're a student looking to get ahead or an expert trying to stay on top, Brilliant has something for everyone. Brilliant actually offers a range of courses on stats and probability, consolidating fundamental techniques discussed in this video, such as approximating and justifying solutions. Its expansive library has thousands of lessons covering everything from fundamental concepts to the complex real-world applications. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, consider visiting brilliant.org slash vix, which is in the description and the pinned comment, and only the first 200 people to use the link will get the full 20% off. For those of you still here, let's continue with the derivation. Let's consider an arbitrarily large group. Let's just say that the comparison composes R people, and the total number of people is just n. The probability that we're looking to optimise is just the probability that the best person is chosen. We can rewrite the statement as the probability that a given partner i is chosen, and the probability that they are also the best. For this to be the same as the first statement though, we need to add this summation at the start, as this essentially means that we're adding the chance that person 1 is chosen and they're the best, and the same for person 2, and so on, until n. From here, we can manipulate this again, using a famous formula found in almost all textbooks called the conditional probability formula, which is a part of probability theory, but its main purpose is to allow us to split the original probability into two. This symbol means given that. So the first probability is the probability that partner i is chosen, given they are the best. The second probability is just asking what the probability of a given person being the best is, although this is something we actually know. Since we know there can only be one best person, we know that the chance that a specific person is the best out of all n people is just 1 over n. 
To make it clear that we're multiplying the entire summation by 1 over n, I will add some square brackets around the entire thing. The next step is quite difficult to understand mathematically, so I thought we could try to understand it visually. We know that the comparison composes the first r people. We're going to focus under what conditions we choose a given person as the ideal partner. Let's imagine that the best person was in the comparison. Let's say, for example, the best person was the third person we spoke to. Well then, following our method, we will reject person 1 and 2 all the way up to R. This means we would have rejected person 3, who was the ideal partner. Well, what about if the ideal partner was the second person we spoke to? Then the exact same thing happens where we reject them again. It seems quite clear that if the best person happened to be in the comparison, then we would have rejected them, and therefore we definitely couldn't have accepted them as the best partner. And therefore, the method would lead to us choosing someone else instead of the ideal partner. Keeping this in mind, we can say that if the best person is in the comparison, or in other words, in the range of 1 to R, then the probability of choosing the best person is zero. We know what happens if the best person was in the comparison, so we now need to consider what happens if the best person was in the remaining people, or in the range of r plus 1 to n. Let's say that this particular person was the best person. Then under what conditions do we actually choose them? Let's again utilise numbers to make this more clear, using the system that we used before. The first condition we need to satisfy is that the question mark needs to be greater than every single number in the comparison, since that's the premise of the method. More clearly, all this means is that the question mark needs to be better than the best of the comparison. The second condition is that the people after the comparison, but before the best person, need to be rejected to ensure that we choose the ideal partner. This means that they need to be worse than the best of the comparison. This can be very hard to understand intuitively, so please pause and really understand what this is. But an easy way I find to think about this is that there needs to be a person in the comparison so good that they cause us to reject most people, but not so good that they cause us to reject everyone. It's similar to them filtering out people we are somewhat compatible with so that we wait until we find the person that we're most compatible with. We can write the next summation from r plus 1 to n. This probability is still given that a certain person is the best. So then, what is the probability they are chosen? This is just that the second best person up to that point, or the best of the first i minus 1 people, is within the comparison, or the first r people. This is quite a big step, so consider pausing or re-watching that part before we move on. From here, we can simplify the expression, with the first summation just being 0. We can then say the second probability can be written as r over i minus 1, since we are assuming the people are evenly distributed. We can then simply pull out the r, and then bring the 1 over n across, and there we go, a really convoluted way to rewrite the original probability. It's useful to remember that this formula represents the probability of success, or originally the probability of choosing the best partner. This new expression may look equally cryptic to help us solve anything, which is why we need to use one last trick. The main issue with this expression is the summation. We need to find a better way to express it, so for the time being let's forget the rest of the expression and focus just on the summation. The first thing we can do is to alter the summation to this, which is just a useful property of summations. From here, we can begin expanding it out to see if we notice any trends. We get 1 over r plus 1 over r plus 1, and so on all the way up to 1 over n minus 1. This trick does require a leap of faith, where we're going to make some steps which seem random but will link together eventually. Let's consider the function of f of x equals 1 over x. When the input is r, the output is 1 over r. Similarly, when the input is r plus 1, the output is 1 over r plus 1, and this will continue to generate terms in our summation. Now let's consider a graph where the output is 1 over x. We know that at the point of r, the output is 1 over r, and at the point of r plus 1, the output is 1 over r plus 1, and so on. We can plot the rest of these points, and we know they'll keep getting smaller but never reach 0. 
Now, I want you to connect the points to create rectangles like the ones being drawn. I want you to try and calculate the area under the graph. We can start with just the first rectangle. The width would just be 1, and the height is 1 over r. So the area is just simply 1 over r. For the next rectangle, the width would again be 1, although the height would be 1 over r plus 1. So the area is 1 over r plus 1. The issue with these rectangles is that this graph is discontinuous. There are edges and vertical and horizontal lines, although the graph of 1 over x is continuous and smooth. I hope you can see where this is going, since we can see that the areas under this graph will not only approximate, but exactly equal the original summation. We can see that the graph of 1 over x passes through all the dots, and is quite close to the same area as the rectangles for most of the graph, although at the start, we can see there's a large discrepancy between the two graphs. That's because in this graph, I've said r equals 1. But we know in reality, the number of people that we reject is bound to be larger than that. With 100 people, it could be 10 or 20 or 30, and in reality, it's actually more than all of these. So let's just consider if r was 31. We can draw the rectangles again, although this time, the graph of 1 over x almost exactly matches the area of the rectangles which means it almost exactly matches the original summation. And for larger and larger values of r, this becomes even closer. This means we can rewrite the original summation as an integral from r to n of 1 over x. From here, the simplification is much easier. We can rewrite the probability of success using this substitution, and integrating this is much easier. The final step we need to do is to use the substitution of u equals r over n. This is because we want to minimize the number of variables. We know what r and n are, and we can therefore say that r over n is just the percentage of people rejected. We can substitute this in, and after doing a little bit more rearranging, we're left with this final result. The input to this formula is the percentage of the total rejected, and the output is the percentage of success rate. We can look at a graph of this and try and find a maximum using some calculus. Doing some standard differentiation leads to a maximum at 1 over e, or roughly 37% of people being rejected. Using this as an input for the probability of success leads to a success rate at also 1 over e, or again 37%. Before I move on to the application of this, I just want to mention the strangeness of e, appearing again as a solution in one of my videos where it seemingly appears from nowhere, and it is not only the percentage of people rejected, but also the success rate. Using these results, let's apply them in the context of the question. Let's imagine that we had 10 people. The percentage of people that we reject is 37%, which rounds to four people. We know that for any given ordering of these people, the chance that we choose the absolute best person is also 37%. Given there's 10 factorial ways to arrange them, that means that even in the 3,628,800 possible orderings, that in 1 over e, or 37% of them, we still manage to choose the absolute best person, which is incredibly high considering all the caveats. Finally, bringing it back to the original question, let's see how our working out can be used. Firstly, we're going to reject exactly 37 people for our comparison. In our comparison, we need to remember how good the best person we spoke to was. In this case, we can see the best person has a compatibility of 99. Now, as we continue to meet people after the comparison, if the new person is better than 99, then hopefully they should be the absolute best person, and if not, then we should reject them. And in this case, like magic, we continue to reject people until person 100, who we accept therefore allowing us to choose the absolute best person to go out with. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I apologise for it taking so much longer than expected. To compensate, I thought I'd finish with some genuine advice I have from personal experience. If you actually do find someone you like, please don't tell her that you carry a calculator in your pocket everywhere you go. And please don't ask her what her favourite number is, and then when she tells you, proceed to argue about why 6 is not only irrelevant, but green. When she says she would rather be friends, at least don't be surprised. It's okay, she didn't deserve you, don't cry. And that's why you're speaking to a microphone and not another person. <laughs> Anyways, don't forget to sign up to Brilliant and watch my other videos here.